Collins will be led in closing prayer by Victor Taylor. You'll take a song book and turn to number 153. Number 153 will be our opening song. We'll be led in uh, singing this morning by Carrie Rosenblum and then Tim Orbison will offer our lesson this morning. Some updates on our sick. Um, just keep Totsy Sanders, remember him. He's still in, in room 757 that I know of. Oh, he's not. He's home. Okay. So he is home. That's good. And also, Cecilia Gray and Sherry Womack is, is uh, recovering from their illness. Sherry's here. I saw Mike. Okay, hey, Sherry. So good. Everybody's doing better. That's good news. Um, also, David Robinson um, isn't feeling well after his chemo. So he is at home this morning recovering. Let's keep, keep him, him in our prayers. Uh, if you took food to the Robinsons, your dishes are in the fellowship hall. And uh, thanks, thanks to everyone who did bring food, and uh, a special thanks for the prayers and visits for the Robinson, from the Robinson family. Ushers, if you'll pick up the visitor's cards at this time, please. Camp applications are available. So if you're planning on going to camp, turn in an application uh, as we need to have a meal and snack count. The deadline for camp applications is July the 4th. Speaking of July the 4th, it falls on a Wednesday, as, as you know, this year. And uh, so there's going to be an activity here at the building. Tim's going to give more details later. But um, plan, we're planning a special evening for everyone here at the congregation. Uh, Starting at 5.30, there will be hamburger and hamburgers and hot dogs, uh, cookout and fellowship dinner. And then everyone is invited to attend. Everybody that, that's going to attend needs to sign up. There's a sheet in the foyer for you to sign so that we can get adequate food preparation for that. Then after the meal, of course, we'll have our summer series uh, with Harold Kelly, who will be our guest speaker that, that evening. And um, then following services, dessert and uh, homemade ice cream served in the fellowship hall and then when we get nightfall then we're just going to be some fireworks in the neighborhood it sounds like a great great evening for everyone so hopefully you want to be part of that also remember our fellowship meal that's tonight after services uh, if you have a birthday or anniversary in may and june you'll be our honored guest for that and uh, the theme is potluck and service team one is responsible for setup and cleanup the ladies helping hands are having a day out on Thursday. You'll be going to Fayetteville. This has been announced several for several weeks, so uh, just check the bulletin for details on that. The Monday night Bible study tomorrow night will be held at the home of Carrie and Pam Rosenblum. Their address is in the bulletin, so be sure you grab a bulletin. Um, one, one change on that, it just said bring desserts and drinks, but understand that the main dish uh, is gonna be chicken enchiladas, so she asked, Pam asked if you can bring a side to go along with, with that uh, and drinks and desserts as well. Items for the Honduras work for this week are boys clothes, sizes toddler, teen, uh, neosporin, band-aids or bandages. Puppet team four you'll be serving tonight in the back in the back. Um, We've begun working on the India VBS material for 2013. If you recall, we did this last year. Um, my understanding is they t the materials that we put together last year taught around 37,000 children. And so we're doing it again this year. And uh, two ways you can help. There are bags in the foyer ready to take home and glue the picture to the construction paper and, uh, with three translations on back. And there are instructions back here on the table on how to do that. Or you can come back today, this afternoon at 2 o'clock. There will be a work session uh, where these activities will be going on, and you can help out with that, and they'll, they'll work on until time for worship tonight. I have a thank you card to read. Maysville Church of Christ, thank you for the Bible and hosting the graduation dinner. Thanks again from Hunter Pinkerton. We'll begin our worship in prayer. Let us pray. 
Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we are thankful for this beautiful morning in front of us, the time we have to be together, to come to you in worship, in song and in prayer, and to partake of the Lord's Supper. Thank you for that blessing. Father, we pray for those that have been mentioned this morning that are sick, to be with Brother Totsi, and to be with Brother David, and give them strength. Pray that we'll continue to support them. Thank you that Sister Sherry is back with us and others that's been uh, ill that's continuing to improve. And Father, we know there's others that's out there that's sick at this time and some are going to have upcoming surgery. Pray that you'll be with them and that their surgery will be successful. Father, we thank you for our health. Father, we pray for our men and women that's providing for our safety, that's overseas, that's in the military, for those that are fighting fires, uh, forest fires, and those that's just risking their lives every day for our safekeeping. We pray for their safekeeping. Father, we pray for the work that's ongoing here at Maysville, for the missionary work, especially the Honduras mission that's upcoming. We pray that you'll be with those that are going to be going. We pray for mental and physical and spiritual strength to them and that their mission will be successful. We pray for our summer camp that's coming up. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our new youth minister that's coming on board. Pray that uh, he'll always turn to you for guidance and that we'll put our arms around him and provide the support that he needs and that he can turn to us and that we're there for him. We pray, Heavenly Father, for this country, for continued freedoms that we so richly enjoy for the sacrifices that's being made and father most of all we pray for that freedom of a home with you in heaven in Jesus Christ we pray amen one hundred fifty three let's everyone join in please one fifty three <clears throat> sweet little one and we heard the Seven hundred thirty-eight. <clears throat> we 
We were glorified, the King of Kings. We were glorified, the Lamb. We were glorified, the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Six hundred forty-five. We take our minds back to the cross this morning. We're reminded of the suffering and, but yet, the ultimate victory that Christ met on that day, and we're reminded of the cross that He was on, the old rugged cross. <clears throat> we'll do the uh, first and the uh, third stanzas, please, <clears throat> before we partake of His supper. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love an old cross where the dearest and Oh
Let us pray. Father, we ask this morning that as we partake of this Lord's Supper, we remember the reason that it was instituted, Father, and that it was on that old rugged cross that your Son was nailed, forming the perfect sacrifice for us, Father, the, the atonement of our sins, Father. Help us to be mindful of the agony that he endured all for us. Help us to consider these things as we partake of this bread. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Holy Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day you've given us. The opportunity we have now to come around this table to realize the great sacrifice of Christ our Son who died upon the cross, shed his blood for the remission of our sins. We pray that each one will partake of this in a manner well pleasing in their sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
number 853, 853. If we have opportunity this morning to give back to God as we've been prospered, we certainly do so uh, out of not obligation, but out of love to him and out of recognition to how good of care he takes of us and how good he is to us, as this song indicates. And um, he knows our concerns and needs before we even ask and knows them better than we do. But again, we ought to give back to him today and in somewhat of appreciation for the care he gives us. <clears throat> God is so good. God so thankful for this opportunity we have to gather around this table and to come and worship you on the first day of the week. We pray at this time now that we might give back to the portion of what you give to us. May we do it in a well-pleasing way in Christ's name. Amen. Please mark number 634, 634, we'll sing that after our lesson this morning. <coughs> and now number 531, 531. <coughs> if you would, please stand and sing out on this one, 531. <coughs> Praise the Lord, ye hands adore him. Praise him. Yeah. 
Good morning and welcome to Maysville. We're glad that you're here. We're thankful for your presence, whether you're visiting with us or your home and family. We're glad that you're with us. We do have some folks visiting with us this morning. One couple, Larry and Brenda Smalley, are visiting with us from Middleton, Tennessee. And uh, you may not know them, but you know of them. Their daughter married Don and Wanda Worley's son. And uh, so they are, well, I don't guess that would make them related exactly, but they're connected. And uh, we're glad to have them visiting with us uh, from Middleton this, this morning and others with us as well. We're glad that you're here. Just a moment for a commercial before we get into our lesson. Um, the July 4th activity that we're planning is a new thing. We've never done anything exactly like this before, but you're going to eat supper or dinner somewhere with, uh, with your family. Why not make it your church family? Wednesday night, July the 4th, come eat hamburgers and hot dogs with us and uh, enjoy that special time together. And then after we get through with a good meal, uh, we'll come and hear uh, Brother Harold Kelly speak at our lectureship this evening or that evening. I know you're planning to go to worship, so you come and be with us and then hang around for some ice cream afterwards. And um, if you're going to see or shoot fireworks, do them right here in the parking lot. So it'll be a great night. We hope that you'll come and plan to be with us. But in order to make the food work out, there are some sign-up sheets in the back on the tables in the foyer. Make sure that you put your name down there, and uh, then all of that will work out and be a great night uh, for us here at Maysville. I'd like to begin this morning in our study with a Bible reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, beginning in the first verse. Mark chapter 16, verse 1 and following. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb where the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right Side, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. King James Version translates that text in verse 6. Behold the place. That's what I've titled our lesson this morning. Behold the place. If we were to make a list of all of the important events, the most important events in world history, it would be an impressive list. But after a discussion, I believe it would be possible to boil that list down to some of the most significant events. And I think after a discussion, it would be possible to conclude that perhaps the most important event of history was the death and then the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. All four of the gospel writers give substantial time to describing both the crucifixion of Jesus and then the Lord's resurrection. It figures prominently in many of the places of Scripture where discussions take place in regard to those things that are important. For example, look at the book of Acts and notice how that uh, there it, it figures prominently. First, there's a statement 
made in Acts chapter 2, uh, the 22nd verse. And I want to read several parts of this text and, and look at the pieces that are there. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know. Him being de de delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Then, Peter goes on to describe the prophecy. Notice down in verse 25. For David himself said concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. Drop down to verse 27. For I, you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now the interpretation of that that uh, Peter gives, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foresaw this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see Corruption. Then a little farther down, we have the eyewitness statement, verse 32. This Jesus God has raised up, of whom we are all witnesses. Jesus himself highlighted the idea of the resurrection. When he was describing things that the people might look for in terms of a sign, John chapter 2, verse 18. The Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? Verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. The resurrection of the dead. Jesus' resurrection. There is no way to describe a greater event. It is the case that as New Testament Christians, every Lord's Day, when we gather together and participate in the Lord's Supper, we not only remember the death that Jesus died, but we remember the resurrection of the Lord. In fact, Paul's discussion of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, do show the Lord's death until He comes. I'd like to do several things this morning as we ponder the resurrection. First of all, I would like to look at some of the events that are related to the suffering and the death of Jesus. And then I want to notice some of the ramifications or the responses that we'll make to those events. I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to do quite a bit of reading. Let's begin in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse 26. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him, took the reed, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, 
put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Verse 35, they crucified him and dividing, divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Drop down to verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Let's go now to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. After the death of Jesus, because of the time it was, Pilate allowed for those who were being crucified that day to have their legs broken. Let's start reading in verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. After it is determined that Jesus is dead, the next thing that occurs is that one of the leading men in the community comes and asks for the body of Jesus. Let's continue our reading in Mark chapter 15, verse 42. Mark 15, 42. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went in to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. Matthew chapter 27, verse 60, tells us that this was a tomb that was not just convenient, but that Joseph had had cut out for himself. He laid it in a new tomb which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door. But that wasn't enough. The Jews were concerned that Jesus' body would be taken and the ramifications of the, the Lord's body being taken away, they recognized was, was a terrible thing. And so the Jews seek to have the tomb of Jesus sealed up. Let's continue reading in Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 62. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate excuse me, said to them, you have a guard, go your way, 
make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. The death of Jesus has occurred. No doubt he is dead. They come and find him dead before they break the legs of the other two men. They pierce his side, confirming that he has expired. He is then taken down from the cross. Joseph of Arimathea takes him, wraps him in linen along with some spices, and puts him in the tomb. The tomb is then sealed. A Roman guard is set outside of the tomb to make sure that the tomb is not disturbed, that the body of Jesus cannot be removed. That's the first half. Let's notice what follows. Still in Matthew, let's start reading in chapter 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. The first thing that occurs is that an angel from God descends from heaven. The door of the tomb is opened along with the great earthquake. Keep reading. Verse 3. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Now verse 5. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples the word. So these women there speak with an angel. The angel tells them. They don't have to draw a conclusion for themselves, finding an empty tomb. The angel tells them, the Lord is risen, like he said he would rise. And he is going to meet you. You will see him again. Some of the writers of the New Testament include more of the details in regard to the meeting of the Lord than others. Uh, these are adequate. The Lord first appears to Mary in a bodily form. Notice here in verse 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So that they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. We could find also in Mark chapter 16, verse 9, Mary is the first one to see the Lord alive. Later on, Luke chapter 24, beginning in the 13th verse and following, the Lord appears to two men on the road to Emmaus. Later, Luke also tells us that the Lord had appeared to Simon, although we don't have the specific report of the Lord appearing before Simon. In at least two places, we have the testimony that the Lord appeared to Simon. There in Luke chapter 24, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when Paul begins to address this topic later. Then there are the ten who are there. John chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. Jesus is with the ten minus Thomas, and he comes and appears to them. And then, a few verses later, the eleven, the uh, disciples of Jesus along with Thomas, whom we uh, describe as doubting Thomas, are met. One more reading in this section, and then we need to move on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul gives what in some ways might be the ultimate summary of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The whole 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection. We're going to read several of the verses, but not nearly all of them. Start with me in verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, 
then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all of the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Paul's description. The Lord died, according to the Scriptures, but the Lord also was raised, according to the Scriptures. And then he gives this list of people who saw the Lord after He was raised from the dead. Simon, all of the disciples, groups, individuals. And Paul says, finally and last, I saw Him after He was risen. So that brings us to an obvious question. Are these statements factual? Should we believe them? After all, it's not every day that a man rises from the dead, is it? There are several interesting things to consider when we determine whether or not these are factual statements in terms of evidence. Number one, the Jews themselves knew that Jesus had laid claim to the fact that He would be raised from the dead. A few moments ago when we read from Matthew chapter 27, the Jews when they went to Pilate argued, Jesus Himself said, after three days I will be raised. So the Jews knew of the prophecy that Jesus had made. That's interesting. Not only did they know it, they wanted steps taken to prevent the disciples from being able to perpetrate a, a fraud. So the Jews, in this case, are actually doing a favor to the authenticity and the, the evidentiary value of the testimony of Scripture. They made sure that no one could come along and steal the body of Jesus away under the cover of darkness. They used the Roman guards, they used the Roman government to make sure that the tomb of Jesus was sealed. That's important. A second observation that we must also make is that not only did they know that Jesus had made the testimony concerning His rising from the dead, not only did they think that there was enough credibility about whatever those events involved that they wanted to make sure the disciples couldn't take that body and go, there's one other key piece of evidence and information that needs to be entered on this, on this note. Matthew chapter 28, let's start reading in verse 11. Those guards who fell down, verse 4, shook with fear and became like dead men, they rise up and come, verse 11. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. Some of the guard, how many men were involved in watching over that tomb? We don't know. But some of them came into town and told what happened. Now look what happens next. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. A Roman soldier caught sleeping on the job would be put to death. But the Jews say, we'll bribe the governor. If anybody finds out about this, we'll make sure that you're taken care of and you won't get in trouble for this. You go and tell the lie. The Jews admitted the disappearance of the body of Jesus. The Jews admitted the truthfulness of the testimony of these guards that they were there when the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead. What's interesting about these facts is that the disciples themselves did not believe Jesus was going to rise from the dead. 
when Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, come to the tomb, they expect to find the body of Jesus. They don't believe he's raised from the dead. They expect to find him there. And when they go and tell the disciples uh, uh, that the Lord has been raised, they don't even believe it. Later on, still in Matthew chapter 28, then the eleven disciples, verse 16, then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw, they worshipped, but some doubted. Even after meeting with Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, some of his disciples still did not believe that Jesus had been raised. There's a wonderful story in Luke chapter 24. Beginning about verse 21, as the disciples, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus began to converse with Jesus, they said, we thought Jesus was the prophet. We thought he was the one who was to come. And now certain of our women have told us that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And others, and Jesus said, what do you mean they told you? And you don't believe it. Later on, Luke chapter 24, the 36th through the 41st verse. Even when Jesus is there with them, some of them don't believe that Jesus was raised. Well, uh, that's perhaps not too unlike what you would expect in real life. What's the importance of the resurrection of Jesus? Number one, it's, re it's necessary to believe in the resurrection as a concept. Back to our discussion in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There are several statements that Paul is going to make in, in a logical fashion and tie them together to the concept of, of what it means to be a Christian. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 12, Paul makes certain that if we understand that if Jesus was not raised, then there are some consequences to that. If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? You remember the discussion in Matthew chapter 22, that the Sadducees did not believe in the concept of a resurrection. They didn't think people raised from the dead. That statement is made specifically in Matthew 22, 23. It was necessary to believe that Jesus was raised. Why? Well, one, it was the sign that Jesus promised. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 40. Jesus said, here's the sign that's going to be given, the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so the Lord will be in, in the earth, and he will rise again. Second reason is because Jesus claimed he would do it. And my time is, is, is gone now, and I'm going to have to abbreviate several remarks. John chapter 10, 15 to 18. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to tell his disciples of him going up to Jerusalem, how that he would be crucified, and how that he would be raised again from the dead. Repeat that. Matthew chapter 20, 17 and 19. Mark 8, 31. Mark 9, 31. John, Mark chapter 10, verse 33. Luke chapter 24, verses 6 and 7. The angels themselves said, Did not Jesus tell you concerning this? The apostles taught it as truth. Acts 2.32, we are his witnesses. Acts 3.15, we are his witnesses. Acts 4, verse 20, we must speak what we have seen and what we have heard. And Paul's reasons here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen... Our preaching is empty, and your faith also is empty. And we are found false witnesses, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. What's the testimony of an empty tomb? It reminds us we're not home yet.
And we have a place to go, that Jesus has a place for his children. Some of the most beloved words of Scripture fall in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, where Jesus said, You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come and receive you again, that you may be there, not if the dead are not raised. It's the testimony of an empty tomb. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. So then Christ was offered once for the sins of the world, but he will appear a second time, not for sin, but for salvation to those who are waiting for him. And I want to conclude with that question this morning. Are you waiting for him? Are you waiting for him to return? Do you believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God? Have you confessed that before men with your mouth and then been buried in water for the remission of sins to enter into Christ Paul says we are baptized into Christ, Galatians chapter 3, 27. We put on Christ. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the good shepherd, I am the only gate into the Father. No one comes to the Father but by me. Are you going to the Father? If so, it is only through the Christ. Maybe the question that you need is the one that Ananias asked Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 22 verse 16 when he said and now why are you waiting arise and be baptized washing away your sins calling on the name of the Lord behold the place where the Lord lay but the Lord is risen and so are all of us who have been raised from the waters of baptism to walk a new life. If this morning that does not describe you, then what would prevent you in a moment when the invitation song is sung of walking down this aisle, confessing before this audience this morning, putting on your Lord in baptism, everything is ready behind me, the water is prepared, clothing is available, everything stands in readiness for you to enter into the covenant with the Lord washed in the blood of Christ, raised to walk a new life. It may be that you are a child of God, but you've forgotten your service. You've forgotten about the Lord's raised King. And you need to come back home. The invitation is for you. This morning, if we can assist you spiritually, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.
Thank you, Tim. 726 will be our closing hymn, 726. We'll do the first and third stanzas before we're dismissed in prayer. Hope you'll be back tonight at 5 o'clock. We'll worship again. And if you have any needs, let us know. And thank you for visiting, if that's the case. <clears throat> We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we did at first and front his resemblance, thou son of God. But day. Thank you that we can gather here, we can learn, we can worship. Help us use what we learn here in our daily lives. Thank you, Lord, for the children here, for the sounds they make. Thank you for their innocence, for their enthusiasm, for the wonder they see in everything. Help us use that ourselves as we learn about you. Thank you, Lord, for those that teach the children. We know it works. We can all remember the ones that taught us when we were little. Bless them, Lord, because they are helping. Thank you, Lord, for the mothers, the ones who bring us here when we're young. The fathers, too, but the mothers take care of us a lot. Thank you for them bringing us, fighting us as we squirm, teaching us at home. Because of them, we're here today. Now go with us, Lord, as we leave here and help us to use what we learn here and look for times that we can help others. In Christ's name, amen.